Today's video is all about the Sony Discman. When I first started to assemble this video, I was mostly going to talk about my car Discman because that's the one I had. Uh, but then I started to dive in a little deeper and really learn more about personal portable music players. And I was kind of fascinated by how quickly the evolution went from cassette to CD to MP3 in about a span of 20 years. So not only do I talk about the history of portable players, I talk mostly about, of course, the history of the Discman plus a little bit of uh, repair of this thing at the end, so enjoy. I really can't start talking about the history of the Discman without giving a somewhat condensed history on the Walkman, of course, that being Sony's compact cassette player that revolutionized portable music. While the compact cassette had its origins in the 60s, it wasn't initially created as a music format. It originally started out as a way for people to record their voices through dictation. By the early 70s, though, Manufacturers and consumers realized its sonic range was quite good, was far more convenient than reel-to-reel -reel and 8-track, and thus, pre-recorded music was becoming a popular choice on cassette. Eventually, the idea of portable music made its way into the minds of Sony executives, and inevitably, the first Walkman, model TPS-L2, went on sale in Japan on July 1, 1979. Sony predicted they would sell about 5,000 units a month, but ended up selling more than 30,000 units in the first two months, thereby confirming that personal, portable music players were in demand. By 1981, however, another music format launched that would dominate them all, digital, by way of the compact disc. Introduced in March of 1983 in the U.S. market, the Sony CDP-101 was the world's first commercially released CD player. As usual with any new technology, cost was the initial barrier to entry to the component CD player, but by 1984, the popularity of the compact disc proved that this format was not just for audio enthusiasts, and the mainstream consumer market wanted the same thing they enjoyed with their cassettes, portability and affordability. Given the immense popularity of the Walkman, it naturally made sense to develop a portable unit for the masses, and so planning began. Using their component size CDP-101 as a starting point, Sony worked to improve its design by reducing the number of parts, decreasing its size, as well as reducing the cost of the unit itself. Legend has it that Sony execs wanted the unit to be sized no larger than a stack of three or four CD cases. While I'm not sure how true that is, by late 1983, Sony was able to produce a unit a fraction of the size of their component CDP-101, so Portable Player was now within reach. In 1984, with an initial sale price of $300, that's $750 adjusted for inflation in 2021, Sony launched their first portable CD player, the D50, or D5 in the North American market, which lovingly gained the name Discman based off its portability in relation to the incredibly popular Walkman. Early versions of the D5 predated the use of the word Discman and are referred to by the awkward Compact Disc Compact Player moniker. Additionally, although small in appearance, the D5 lacked a built-in power source, so a battery pack or docking station had to be used. In the early days, all CD players were highly susceptible to skipping. That meant Sony's D5 was only portable in the sense that it could be taken from place to place relatively easily versus a component unit. Using a D5 while in motion required careful walking, and activities such as exercise or jogging were simply not practical. Not surprisingly, that didn't stop salespeople and Sony marketing from touting the D5 as an on-the-go device. By 1987, though, compact disc technology had improved to the extent that the new Discman, model D20, was able to offer a built-in battery compartment which could take a factory-supplied rechargeable battery or four AA batteries, thereby enabling true portability. Fast forward to 1990. At the time, CD players installed directly in cars was very expensive, and typically meant you'd have to give up your cassette player in lieu of a CD unit. With the addition of built-in power supplies and advances in stabilization, Sony introduced the aptly named Car Discman, a unit targeting users who desired to take their CDs in the car with them via a cassette adapter. The Car Discman, model D180K, featured a dual damper anti-shock system to alleviate skips and jumps due to bumps in the road. This mechanism, which specifically held the optical laser and motor, was suspended on springs inside the case and was also dampened with small fluid-filled rubber bags. Speaking of lasers, as a funny side note, when CD players were first introduced, I had always thought the laser was an actual solid bright beam of light, like they show in that George Michael Freedom 90 video. I was wrong, but it would have been cool if it worked like that. Anyway, as I was researching my personal car disc man, 
The one thing that struck me was the differences in sound quality among units. While the cassette Walkman sounded adequate, its main appeal was its portability. And if you connect a Walkman and a component tape deck to your home stereo, you can easily tell the difference in sound quality by ear alone. Technically speaking, though, let's take a look at the frequency response ranges used to measure a device's sound output abilities. The human hearing range is, hey, it looks like that ear has Wi-Fi. I wonder if that's considered a hotspot because, you know, 98.6 degrees. The human hearing range is 20 to 20,000 hertz. Although there is some variation between individuals, especially at high frequencies or age-related hearing degradation. But for the sake of this video, the range is 20 to 20,000 hertz. Starting with my Walkman, model WM8, it claims a frequency response range that spans a mere 40 to 15,000 hertz. Compare that to my component tape deck, model TC-WR690, which spans 30 to 18,000 hertz. The Walkman's range is completely inside of the component unit. Again, you can hear the difference without the need of fancy testing equipment. And to use a Walkman on your home hi-fi system would be an obvious downgrade. But the Discman is digital, and the componentry used to decode and output sounds is different than an analog device. When I was a teen, I used to own a component CD player model CDP470, and its frequency range spanned from 20 to 20,000 hertz. My car Discman also spans from 20 to 20,000 hertz. You can see that both the CD component unit and the Discman have a full dynamic range that made portable units as equally desirable as component units and could easily be used in a home hi-fi system. By the year 2000, the name Discman was retired and renamed CD Walkman. Additionally, Sony also introduced new branding in the shape of a W composed of several connected dots for all their media players including the new MP3 format. The early 2000s audio market saw the growth of the MP3 music format, and although still digital, the need for moving parts, lasers and motors, was becoming increasingly obsolete. In all, Sony produced 40 versions of the Discman between 1984 and 1999, with each iteration a little better than the last. I'm pleased to know that my car Discman has lasted 30 years and still sounds as good as the day I got it. Honestly, I haven't used it for 20 years, and it's been sitting in a storage tub all that time. I do remember that there was an issue with the 9-volt plug not working, so let's crack this thing open and see if I can fix it. I'll insert the 9-volt center negative plug here, and you'll see that it just kind of moves around. Um, it's loose. I think there's a solder connection that's just not uh, right, so I'm going to remove the screws and see what's inside. Removing the screws is pretty straightforward. There is a slightly longer screw at that orange dot, um, so when you do go to reassemble it, just note that that is a longer screw for that one. There are also two screws on the back, so don't forget to remove those as well. Once you've removed the screws, you can simply pull the bottom of the unit away. I'm going to insert that 9-volt plug again and move the plug around to see what's going on, and I think you'll be able to see here, I was right, the solder connections are definitely loose. And here you'll be able to see it up close. Uh, this one particular on the right there seems to be the one that's really not making any connection. The other two connections are also loose, so I'll solder all three of them. Here I'm just propping it up on a remote control to make the connection, um, I guess, make a better connection first, and use a little bit of gravity pulling down on the unit so that the, uh, the connection points are in the right spot before I begin to solder. As you can see, this is a very high-tech professional setting I have here using a remote control as a prop. And I'm just getting in there and adding a little tiny bit. Doesn't need much, just needs to secure that connection up again. Now that it's had some time to cool off, I'm going to remove this remote and just check to make sure everything's tight. And here you can see it clearly is kind of back to the way it should be. I don't know if you could tell from this shot here, but it's a little bit dirty, kind of, I guess, dusty and who knows. So I'm going to take some isopropyl alcohol and just swab this to clean it. I'll be honest, I'm not sure if this is the right thing to do with electronics, um, but I'm taking a bit of a chance. I kind of have nothing to lose because I still really don't listen to CDs anymore, but it was pretty filthy. So as you can kind of see, I'm getting a lot of grime off of here. Um, so I figured it needs a good cleaning. 
I'm also not sure why this has such a yellowy looking residue that's coming off. Um, I never smoked and it's never been out of my possession or in any house that smoked. So I have no idea what, why this is like that, but that's the color that's coming off. So here it is all cleaned up. I think it looks a lot better. Again, I don't know if that was the right thing to do or not, but um, it looks cleaner to me. So I'm going to go with it. Oh, and I also put some Windex on this uh, bottom cover here, too, before I assembled it back together. I realize I didn't dive very deep with the disassembly of this disc man, but uh, this is me just putting the bottom cover back on and putting the screws back in. And just a quick reminder, that long screw goes at the orange dot there. So don't forget that long one is the only one that'll fit into. And I know that because I found out the hard way, because I put that long screw in the wrong hole first, and you can see me taking some in and out here, even though it's sped up, um, I do eventually get it right. And I, I don't know if that's what that orange dot is for, but that's where the long screw goes. Anyway, there it is, reassembled, and hopefully it will work when I plug it in. One thing I forgot to mention is how I was very impressed with how the lights still worked on this unit. Like, as in the full lighting that they had when I remember buying it. It is as bright as the day as it was 30 years ago. So I figured, let's listen to some music in the dark next to the stereo. I figured the orange glow would look really cool next to each other. So, but here it is. It works, and it's great. Even the light at the cover window uh, to show the disc spinning is just as bright as the day I remember getting it. So, again, I don't really listen to CDs, um, but this unit looks pretty cool next to the stereo, so I don't know, I might just keep it as a part of my hi-fi system now. So there you have it, some history of the Discman. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. And thank you for watching.